Please welcome to the stage the founders and executive team of Midsummer Scream. Executive Director David Marklin. Executive Producer Gary Baker. Producer Claire Dunlap. And Creative Director Rick West. Boy, full house again. Thank you for coming to Midsummer Screams. Everybody having a good time. Uh, thanks for being with us all weekend. Um, this is our sixth year. For us, though, uh, uh, also I think everybody on stage as well, this is also the tenth year since we did another event, started another event called Scare LA. Uh, who is here for the first Scare LA? All right. And uh, thanks to everyone who's joined us along the way. Um, we're super proud of Midsummer Scream. There's another person who's been with us at every one of our events, the every one that we've been part of for the past, you know, over the last ten years. That is John Murdy, who's here tonight at Halloween Mornings. So it means so much to us personally that he's here. He's continued to come back, puts our trust in us. But you know, I was just talking to him backstage. He is. Uh, he said, "Can I go a little long?" I'm like, "I said, I think they'll, I think they'll enjoy that." Um, Anyway, that's enough about me right now. Thank you again for coming. Gary? Hey, everybody. Did you have a good time this weekend? This is just an amazing crowd. I mean, the theater is completely full. So thank you all for coming in and attending. We know this is one of the biggest panels in the entire show. So thanks again. Um, I just wanted to do a quick shout out to my tech team that's back here. It's Jim and Anthony, Call Brothers Productions. And also Todd, Jesse, and Kevin. They, they keep all nine stages operating with all this content. We had some amazing panels. Uh, we're pretty much in here in this theater all the time, but the talent that was here this weekend was absolutely incredible. And we're so happy that you all attended the panels. And we'll turn it over to Claire. Hi, everyone. Oh my gosh, look at us all. We're like a small country in here. It's fantastic. Thank you again. I know we're all saying thank you. We're just so grateful. We are so happy how this weekend turned out. It was a fabulous turnout with all of you. It takes a village to put this on, and you guys are all part of that village. We do this for you and because we love to do it. We so appreciate you, we appreciate our White Bats, and we are just thrilled to have you here. And thank you for coming, and I'm gonna ask everybody again, did you have fun? Yeah. That's what we wanna hear, all right. And to Mr. Rick West. Yay! What's up, Rick? What's up, Rick? Well, so in 2016, I said, we're going to create a show that this community wants and deserves. And every year since then, I've asked the same question, have we done you proud? We're here because you're here, and it's a really great symbiotic relationship. And seeing everybody that has come out this weekend, thank you for spending your time with us here. This is one more huge step to getting life back to normal, right? And God, did anybody think that anybody was going to call you normal this weekend? So thank you again. I want to thank all the haunters in the Hall of Shadows. Did you guys check that out? The, the facades are ridiculous in there. Like, if you haven't had a chance yet, well, there's YouTube. But... Uh, <laughs> But thank you to all the haunters that have done that. Special shout out to Cal Haunts. For the past five years, they've done our entry experience to the Hall of Shadows, and they knock it out of the ballpark every single year. So we're blessed by them. We're blessed by all the haunters that have participated, and we are blessed by you, our community. Thank you, and happy early Halloween, everybody. Welcome to Midsummer Scream. Here we are at the
the bitter end of our weekend at Brewers. And as you can see, we've saved one of the biggest treats for last. Universal Studios Hollywood's Halloween Horror Nights. Will there be chills and dreams? Oh yes. Will there be a glimpse of things to come this Halloween? Of course. Will there be a major reveal? You can bet your life on it. Here's the man with the sinister plan. All the way from Ireland, please welcome John Murdy. I should have filmed that for yeah. my kids. <laughs> let me, okay, let me start with this, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, for anybody who does what we do with Halloween Horror Nights, uh, everybody who works on this event, all the talented men and women, um, if there's one thing we know is that we are extremely lucky and extremely privileged to be able to do what we do and create what we create for all of you because without you I would probably be operating a puppet show <laughs> somewhere in, in Dublin you know on Grafton Street um, everything we do all the passion and the work we put into this event it's all for you guys so thank you for all your support year after year after year after year, 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 after year. This is 17 years for me now. 18. 18 if you count 2020. Which I do. We built it. Um, let's see. There we go, baby. You know this, right? By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. How about an announcement right out of the gate? I have to ask you guys, did we announce anything when I was in the air? Because I was on a plane flight for like 11 hours. Did anything happen Friday? Monsters and exorcists. Three mazes, the same day? How about another one? But first... A history lesson. We've had a long history of creating original Latin American themed horror content of Halloween Horror Nights, right? This actually goes all the way back to 2010. That was the first year we did La Llorona as a scare zone. And then, of course, we had the La Llorona mazes 2011, 2012. 2013, we teamed up with Danny Trejo to do El Cacue. And then kind of the second phase began. We started working with Latin American film directors. It started with Robert Rodriguez on his TV series From Dust Till Dawn. And then um, Guillermo del Toro. Doing Crimson Peak. And then seven years. <laughs> Seven years went by where we didn't really do that. Um, you know, we moved on to other things, we started doing other opportunities, and then coming out of like, you know, 2021, um, I noticed the uh, plaza, the Universal Plaza, the way we themed that around Day of the Dead, and I noticed everybody inside it, and you know, my brain, something in my brain just clicked that year, and I went, we gotta get back to this. This is what we should be doing. And so, Last year, we brought back La Llorona. La Llorona, the weeping woman. Um, so it feels like it's time for something else, huh? The legends and myths of Latin America at Halloween Horror Nights continues with... Monstros, the monsters of Latin America.
study this real well, there's gonna be a quiz at the end, okay? So what is this? This is an all-new haunted house that features three infamous monsters, or monstros, which is Spanish for monsters, of Latin America. What's wrong with this picture? Somebody really screwed up. <laughs> I'm gonna explain that in just a second. But um, this is something I wanna do today. Uh, you know, I've been doing this show, as, as the team said, you know, I've been doing it every single year that there's been a Midsummer Scream and Scare a Lay before that. Um, so I'm always up here, I'm always the spokesperson for the event, I'm always doing all the media and the press, but the reality is there are hundreds, literally hundreds of talented men and women that work on this event, right? I don't create this by myself. It takes everybody's passion, everybody's hard work, everybody's dedication. So as we're going through this presentation today, and he wasn't kidding, I don't know how to edit, so <laughs> I was making this, you know, back in Ireland, and I was like, ah, oh, it'd be cool to talk about that. Oh, it'd be cool to talk about that. And I just went, you know what, I'm just, let's just go for it. Let's just put everything in it. But I did want to point out, um, right off the, the bat, right at the top of the presentation, um, uh, an individual named Rose Gonzalez. And Rose Gonzalez works with our marketing department. So back in, um, back in 2010, when we first decided to do La Llorona, um, I'll be totally honest with you, I did not grow up with La Llorona. That's not a story I was told as a kid. Um, so I really needed to do my research. And we take our research very, very, very seriously at Halloween Horror Nights, no matter what we're doing, whether it's a movie, a television show, original house, we do a ton of research. Um, but I've always used Rose as my touchstone for things that have to do with our Latin American houses. And, um, and now this year I've been working with um, Universal Studios Hollywood's DEI team. We'll give it up for them as well. Do you know what DEI stands for? Diversity, equity, inclusion. Should have been, should have been diversity, inclusion, equity, because then it would have been die, and that would have been a lot cooler for a horror event. But um, they've been a big help to me as well. Um, and you know, back when the days of La Llorona, we turned to our partners at Telemundo, we turned to actors, we worked with Diego Luna, and he helped us out with La Llorona. You know, when we were doing El Cucuy, it was Danny Trejo. So um, this team had a big impact on everything you're about to see, because I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of this house. Let's meet the monstros. We'll start with our first one, and this is, I'll give anybody a penny <laughs> if you can pronounce this name. Anybody? Talal Hupuchi. Talal Hupuchi. Um, this is a character that comes from the Tlaxcala region of Mexico, and it's really interesting because it's a witch, but it's also a vampire. And with any of these Latin American myths and legends, you know, they're all passed down orally for hundreds of years. In fact, Talal Hupuchi, some people think the origins of the story go back to Aztec times. That's how old it is. But I'll give you the, the version that's the most common version, right? Because there are variations to the story. But in the most common version, anybody can be a Talal Hupuchi. It could be you. It could be you. It could be you. Um, you don't know when you're a little kid that you're a Talal Hupuchi until you reach, like, puberty. And then things start to change, as they do. Um, and you become aware that you are, in fact, a Talal Hupuchi. So a Talal Hupuchi has to do a very, very specific ceremony, and then it transforms into one of a series of animals. Uh, but the most common one is a turkey vulture. And it flies to the house of its victim, and it sucks the blood out of them. It doesn't bite them like a vampire. It sucks the blood through the skin, and it leaves these telltale bruises and markings. So Talalopuchi is the first of our monsters. And I'll give you a little facts as we go along that came out of the research we did on this house. Um, you know, as late as the 1950s, there was a particular doctor in Mexico who was trying to figure out why the infant mortality rates were so high in this particular region where this story originates. And he noticed, he pulled all these death certificates and he was doing his research and he was studying and he noticed that cause of death all the parents were writing on it, Talalopuchi, or witch. So that's what first brought this story to like larger attention. Um, the last known execution of a Talalopuchi was 1973. 
monsters are real. <laughs> let's meet our next one. Actually, let's take a look at the character design for Talala Pucci. So this is our iteration of Talala Pucci. We kind of have two different versions going on here. The one you see in the white dress that's more pale skin, that's a brand new Talala Pucci, just started feeding. The one you see in the red, that's a Talala Pucci that's been around for a while and has ingested a lot of blood. And I should say there are male Talala Pucci's and there are female Talala Poochies. But we're going with the female Talala Poochies because they are stronger than the males. Girl dad. <laughs> um, our next monster is La Lechuza. Some of you were right on the internet. <laughs> Some of you, I think they're doing La Lechuza. I have no idea how you got that, but you were right. Um, La Lechuza, also known as the Owl Witch, okay? And this comes from all over Mexico, but it also comes from the southwestern United States, particularly Texas. And I'll give you again the most common iteration of this story. There's an old woman who lives in a village. She's the kind of old woman that, you know, people whisper about, and people become convinced that she's a witch, so they put her to death. But she comes back as La Lechuza. So she's a combination old woman and a witch. And there's one particular thing the La Lechuza does that's extremely creepy. And again, you can go on the internet and read all about this. There's like endless Reddit pages about people's encounters with La Lechuzas. Um, but one thing that it does is late at night, if you're in your house and you hear a baby crying, don't go outside. Because the La Lechuza can disguise its voice to sound like an infant crying. And then when you go out of the house to see what's going on, it swoops down and picks you up. Monstro fact, in 1975, a town in South Texas, and this is documented in the press, was terrorized by a La Lechuza. People started seeing it, they saw it flying overhead, um, they started calling into their local radio stations. There's even actually a song written about this that was released called La Lechuza. We're not using it in the house because it's kind of silly, but um, it was a huge big deal. And this is what they eventually found. Two boys, <laughs> two boys made this and stuck it up in a tree and they kept moving it around <laughs> into different trees. And this is a picture from the local newspaper when the police finally figured out what was going on. Best prank ever. I need to hire those two kids for Horror Nights. Because we did stuff like that when we were kids. Did you guys do stuff like this? We used to like rib dummies like, you know, through a tree and, and make it so somebody would be walking down the street late at night and it would just suddenly stand up right in front of them. Don't do that, by the way. <laughs> I remember being chased through a field by somebody when I was a kid. Um, but the weird thing about this story is, okay, so they saw it in a tree. It doesn't explain why so many people saw it flying overhead and they described it as this huge bird. So monsters are real. And this is our design for La Lechuza. Nice. And that brings us to our third and possibly last monster. And that is El Silbon. I bet you didn't figure this one out, right? Nobody? Okay. Uh, El Silbon, which translates to the Whistler, is from the Los Llanos region of Colombia, Venezuela. And it's another great story. Uh, different iterations of the story, I'll give you the most common one. So there's a, a boy, which is really like a, you know, late teenager boy, um, living on a farm, fairly well off. Um, he falls in love with a woman that the father does not approve of. And the father tells him, get rid of this woman, but he's in love and he doesn't get rid of him. So one day the father comes into the barn and he catches the boy and the girl and he flies into a rage and he murders the girl, kills her right in front of the son. The son flies into a rage and murders his father. And then granddad comes home, sees what's been done, and he takes the boy out to the field, ties him to a post, whips him repeatedly with a whip until the flesh falls off his back. Then he takes like limes and like tequila and pours it in the wounds. And if that wasn't bad enough, then he sets wild dogs upon him that rip him to shreds. And as this horribly mutilated guy is stumbling towards the woods, 
The grandfather comes up to him and hands him the sack of his father's bones, his murdered father's bones, and says, you are condemned for all time to carry the bones of your murdered father on your back. And he disappears into the woods and he's not seen again. And then eventually this creature comes out of the woods that is now known as El Saban. And it's a towering creature. Some say he's like 10, 12 feet tall, really, really skinny, carrying the bones of his murdered father on his back. And he's known for his distinctive whistle that kind of rises and falls. If you hear this whistle and it sounds far away, that means El Saban is actually really close. But if you hear the whistle and it sounds close, that actually means he's far away. So we'll give you a monstro fact about El Saban. Aside from the distinctive whistle that gives him his name, uh, he is said to prey primarily on womanizers. And drunks. You're all screwed. <laughs> You're not making it out of this haunted house, apparently. All right, let's take a look at our design for El Saban. So obviously we're, we're doing him as a still walker in key scenes. Um, and let's get into some environments and the inspiration for said environments. And again, um, I'm going to do some team member appreciation. My longtime creative partner on Halloween Horror Nights, Mr. Chris Williams. Chris is our art director. He's our production designer. Um, since 2006, Chris and I conceive everything, uh, all of the houses for Halloween Horror Nights together. We do it as a team. We always have. But working um, with Chris, who's been his right-hand woman um, since the very beginning as well, is Brandy Creason, who's our production design manager. And Brandy and Chris and a staple of really talented production designers from Hollywood films and television, they manage that entire team every year, drawing every single, every single wall and every single house by hand. Um, and their work is invaluable to the success of Halloween Horror Nights. They're, you know, I come up with like, you know, the, the written word, and then they translate it into what it visually looks like. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about what they've been up to lately. Um, we're gonna start with the setting for this house. Um, when we were thinking about where to set this particular house, being that it's a new original house, we wanted to create a really iconic place to kind of ground the house in. So I started doing research, I did endless research, pulled hundreds and hundreds of images, but these two images in particular really stuck with me and this is really what Brandy and Chris really latched onto as well. Um, they're graveyards in Mexico, one's from Guadalajara, one's from Guanajuato. Um, but I really liked in the long kind of rectangular image that Gothic Mexican architecture of that mausoleum. We thought that was a really cool element. And then the other one that I really liked was the idea of these sealed crypts that you see in the other image. Um, so we created this place that we call the Cemetery of the Lost. Um, and the idea here is that this is the place where every one of the victims of these monsters are buried. And it is a forsaken, condemned place that you do not go at night because the weather is always bad. It's always thunder and lightning here. Um, once your relatives are buried there, you never go back to visit them. This is just where they live. Um, this is the elevation, the color elevation for the facade. You know, it's funny. Um, I, I see what you guys say a lot of times, you know, on Twitter and whatnot. And uh, I saw this one guy and he goes, I think that's a mausoleum, right? And this other guy goes, that's impossible. There's no such thing as a two-story mausoleum. Nico. Nico. Two-story mausoleum. <laughs> and if you could peek over the fence right now, this is what you'd see. Uh, this is the mausoleum being built right now. This was taken about a week ago. Um, we're just getting into the vine work. But if you look in the front, it looks kind of empty. And it's not going to be empty. There's a lot more coming. Um, this is another piece of inspiration. I love these mourning statues that we found in these cemeteries in Guanajuato and thought that was a really cool element. So I'm gonna give you like the down view. This is the ground plan looking down and that's a side elevation of the facade. Um, you see the big like above ground crib with the statue, but you see something else. And this is gonna get back to that piece of key art at the beginning. You see the guy standing there holding a shovel? Okay, we thought it would be cool to create our own original character to add to this mix. 
And this character would be like the narrator of the experience. He is the caretaker of the cemetery, and when we were trying to conceive what he should look like, um, we were really thinking about like traditional looks for the Grim Reaper. So I pulled all this research, these are just a few of the images. Um, does anybody know what the photograph is? And don't say Bill and Ted's bogus journey. <laughs> Does anybody know who that actor is? Very famous in a very famous horror movie. Mox Van Sydow, who plays the priest in The Exorcist. This is Mox Van Sydow back in the 1950s in a, a foreign film called The Seventh Seal, where he plays death. Um, so we pulled that image. The, then we pulled images from Aztec culture. We pulled images from the Middle Ages. We pulled images from the Renaissance, all different iterations of death, put it into our mind blender, and then came up with this. So, this guy actually doesn't have a name. We never, like, officially named him. In our mind, it's kind of like those Clint Eastwood spaghetti westerns. You know, like, he's always the man with no name who comes to the town, and you never know what his real name is. So, he's kind of our man with no name. But we were thinking, Chris and I, when we were working on this, we're like, well, that's just going to get annoying after a while. <laughs> we're going to be in meetings, and they're like, okay, we're talking about wardrobe for the man with no name, and we'd have to say that over and over and over again. So we just call him Muerte, which is Spanish for death. And he is going to be the guy you meet out in front. He's the pre-show, if you will, for this haunted house. He's going to be telling you the story about these three monsters. Um, and he's designed with an articulated jaw so that the actor wearing the mask can lip sync to track. And you're going to see he's kind of the bookends of the haunted house as well. So, when we came up with this idea for the cemetery, we thought, well, this is cool. This will be like the portal that you go through that transports you to all the world of these different monsters. Um, so this is when you step through that crypt. Again, I want to point out, two-story. Two-story. I just feel like I have to validate that guy, because he was right. He, like, nailed it right out of the gate. So, you enter this two-story mausoleum, and there's all these rotting skeletons of all the people that are buried inside that you have to go through. Um, and I kind of snuck a pic the other day. What? I like the guy in the middle. I'm just like, I'm obsessed with him now. I saw the, these pictures were coming in from the field, and I'm like, who's that guy? I'm going to call him Bruno. So, we don't talk about Bruno. It's just like, he's just like, and the guy behind him is just like, hey, let me see, you know, and he's just like, no, Bruno, <laughs> Bruno has to look now. Well, an area we call Fontes or the Los Infants, Infantes or the um, infants. you start discovering, um, you start discovering these bassinets. One thing I didn't tell you about this lady, she's, 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 she's very particular. She's very particular. She feeds on blood. She feeds on blood. And she'll drink and she'll anyone's blood drink if she's desperate, anyone's blood blood if she's desperate really, enough, really, she really, really, really prefers the blood of an infant. The blood of that's an infant. Like the sweetest that's like tasting the sweetest tasting blood. So there's all these bassinets, so there's all these but, they're bassinets all but they're all empty. And there's always a moment in Horror Nights, particularly with these houses. Particularly last year, houses, last year, last year with Lai Ronan, going back to when we first did it, and we've seen across, across the river. The scene across you know, the river. Do you guys know, you know what I'm talking about, right? When you get right? to the town, when you, 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 you get to the town, the river, and you have to cross the river, and there's the kids floating in the water. I have to tell you how we did that. I have to tell you how we did that. It's really weird. Because it's it's really weird. There's only like there's only like water. Two inches of water. It's like pond liner. It's like pond liner. It's like pond in your backyard. Pond in your backyard. So when we first did this, when we first did this, Tony and I were prop Tony. We're like, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna float these kids? We're like, oh, we'll cut them in half. And now this is what I do with my children. And now this is what I do with my children when they're misbehaving. Put that down. Put that down. Are you going to end up in daddy's? Are you going to end up in daddy's? Uh, um, so this is a scene. Where so this is a scene where you're walking painting, towards another crib painting. It's all over you. It disappears, and then you'll see. You'll see. Let's talk about La Lechuza. Let's talk about La Lechuza. So for La Lechuza, so for La Lechuza, it goes back to research. Right? When I'm doing research, right? when I'm doing to research like, and I have to wonder, there's like, got to be somebody. In there's got to be somebody in IT by now. <laughs> <laughs> looks at my search history. It looks at my search history, and yeah. it's just like, and it's just like, you got a problem. <laughs> But one of the things I was but researching, one of the things I was researching birds is carnivorous nests. birds' nests. Because there's one thing, because there's one thing do that certain birds do that's, really, birds do that's really, really messed up. When they kill, when they kill an animal, they use their bones. They use their bones to decorate, their, bones to decorate their, their nest. They like adorn with their nest the with, with the bones of their victim. And I thought that's awesome. And I thought that's awesome. <laughs> Lala chooses an owl. Lala chooses an owl. An owl. She, must She's an owl. An owl. she must have a nest. She must have a nest. So we built her so, a nest. So we built her a nest. 
so this is another color so elevation, is another color elevation, color elevation that Lala chooses and you see all, and you see all of her, her nest is made out of all these found objects, twigs, 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 twigs and twigs, sticks and twigs, sticks and twigs, and the bones of her victims. And the bones of her victims. And what this really speaks to, this really speaks another to, remember on our team, remember on our team that we want to appreciate and acknowledge Tony Lindis, Tony Lindis. Tony Lindis is our Tony prop Lindis is our prop master. He heads up a team. He heads up a team of talented men and women, and, women, and they come from all different you know, walks in the industry. You know, working in the industry, film, television, to television but they come to Horror Nights and, and work for us year after year. To do all the props, to do all the props and dressing in our house, and there is a mountain you can imagine. If you can imagine. And, uh, and, a lot of times, um, Tony's, team, lot of times, Tony's team has to just wholly create and this things. is a good example. And this is a good example. So I snuck these so pictures, snuck from, these our pictures from our secret, secret facility, that, facility, that, facility that you don't know about. <laughs> and um, and I, had to uh, I had to crop this picture too. I would have, because if I would have left the, the whole picture, picture Chucky, you would have seen like... Chucky. Yeah. You can't see that. Yet. You can't see that yet. That's a surprise. That's a surprise. Um, but these are the bodies that you see in the nest that you in the nest that Tony has to create had to create and then you see the, the work these, they're doing to make these you places, know, where these uh, places where these places where these rotting corpses are being contained. All of that is done by hand. All done by our props and dressing team. So give it up for our props and dressing team. So give it up for our props and dressing team. 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 Props and we were like, it'd be really cool. Well, it'd be really cool if you walked into this house. If you walked into this house and you saw this giant lava chusa, like in her nest, somebody in her nest. So. So we went to some other individuals, we went to some on, our other individuals on our team. Uh, again, uh, I want to point out again, these individuals, out these individuals in the last few because years, in the last few we years have been we have been up stepping it up effects. on special effects. And this year, and this year, what do you see? What do you see with talented men and women? Talented created? men and women it's insane. created. It's insane. Um, David um, Borning. Um, David Borning. Heads up our special heads effects up team. Our special effects team. And Paul, who's now and going Paul, to change his name because, change I can't his name because I can't pronounce it. <laughs> I'm going to try Paul. I'm going to try Paul. Paul Vesalakos Law? Vesalakos Law? Is that good? Close? Is that good? Close? What I love about David, what I love about and, Paul David is, and Paul is they want to do more than, we, do ask more than we ask them to like, do. Do you guys go through Scarecrow? Do you guys go through Scarecrow? Yeah. Yeah. Remember that bird that was eating an eyeball that was eating an eyeball that was like dangling in his mouth and it was, was around and it was moving around? That was all that. Well, that was all that. I didn't even write that in, I don't think. In the treatment, I don't think. They were just like, hey, we can make a bird. And I was like, do it. So, so the other the other individuals that they work with who are a massive, massive, and are working on this particular particular piece is our Universal Studios Hollywood Technical Service Department, mechanical engineers. These people, these people, I, I, I will give them the bow. I will give them the bow. Of, you know, you know. Where do you see Chucky? Where do you see Chucky? I keep saying that. I keep saying that. I don't want to show you. And I don't want to show you. I just want you to experience um, it. Um, but they're doing stuff that they're I never doing stuff that I never thought we could do like with this. Like this. So this is a, a so video. So this is a, a video when we were building the lava chusa. The lava chusa. It's like the, the T1000 like actor skeleton for her. Uh, the cardboard, uh, is, the a cardboard severed, is a severed, you know, arm slash you leg. Know, arm slash leg. You can see his wings are unfurling. And I think in my treatment when I wrote it, it didn't, didn't have, have any of that. And they were just like, hey, we think we can do this. And it's amazing. And it's amazing. The only problem is I don't know how to hide those three guys on set. You have to like throw a sheet over them or something. But they're doing amazing. But they're doing amazing work, and we can't, can't wait to share it with you. All right, El Salon. All right, El Salon. So now we've kind of so now been we've kind of been indoors for a long time. We want to break it up. We want to do a big outdoor scene. So for El Salon, so for El Salon, we really want to take you to a village because he typically comes and attacks people who are leaving. You know, who are leaving a village on the crossroads late at night. This goes back to research again. This goes back to research again. As I was doing research, I came across this. I came across this. Pulquerias. Pulquerias. Does anybody know what that is? Does anybody know what that is? Or polka? Yeah, yeah. To explain it in like to explain it in you know, like American, you know, American like, terms, in the Wild like, West. In the this Wild would West, this like would be the saloon. equivalent of like a saloon. This would be a place you go. This would be a place you go. A drink, for, maybe a drink, some food, maybe some food, dancing, some, some dancing, gambling, some and probably gambling, a lot of fights, and probably a lot right? of fights. Um, right? Polka is an um, alcohol, is is an alcohol from that's derived from cactus, derived cacti. From cactus cacti. Um, what I loved about um, it, what I loved about it, is that's what it looks like in its pure state. It looks like right. It looks like foamy white milk. And I thought. And I thought, 
We can bind blood. We can bind blood. <laughs> it was like blood running. It was like blood running. Foamy white and foamy okay. white running okay. together. That running really together. Disgusting. That would be really disgusting. Um, um, so we decided to create. So we decided to create our own. Um, Bocaria. Um, and then um, next door is the and next Sevilla, door is the butcher shop. Sevilla, the butcher um, shop. Um, so as you head so in, as this, you head into this Bocaria, we have a scene called Bocaria. We have a scene called Bocaria. And, and basically, Elsa Bond is coming in, and, and, and he's just killed every single person, every single person, every single every single single person in his joint, particularly the womanizers and the drunks. I didn't mention how. I didn't mention how he. This is the tweet part. This is the tweet part. If you're a drunk, if you're a drunk. Um, he sucks the alcohol, sucks the out, of alcohol their body, out of their navel. body through their navel. Yeah, yeah. I was like, hmm. I was like, hmm. <laughs> nah, nah. <laughs> but with womanizers, but with womanizers, he rips them apart. He rips them apart. Literally, rips, literally, 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 literally rips out, out of their body. Out of their to his he adds it to his sack. He has his father, that he has his father's bones. So in. this is a dead. Body. So this is a dead body. Am I kidding? It really is. Am I kidding? It really is. This is not like it's in my closet. It's not like it's in my closet or something. As far as you know. As far as you know. Um, no, this is from body um, wars. No, this is from body wars. Goes around the world. That goes around the world. But I needed to know. But I needed to know. Like, what does the back look like? What like, does the spine look like? Because we wanted to do a scene where Elsa Bond literally rips somebody's spine back right out of their back. And that's Elsa Bond. And that's Elsa Bond. Now for the finale. Now for the finale of this house. After you've gone through all these different layers, we wanted to do something really special. And again, it comes back to research. And again, it comes back to research. So I found these. The statue is in a statue. Is in a believe it or not, Elsa Bond. I believe it. Elsa Bond theme park. I might go to this place. I might go to this place. It's crazy. It's crazy. But this is huge. It's this huge towering statue. Looking at. But when I was looking at it, I thought, oh, that's the bones. But the bones like spilling out of the sack. Because another thing Because another thing Elsa Bond. Let's say he's walking. Let's say village, he's walking through your village late at night. He might stop in front of your house. He might sit down that giant sack of bones and then one at a time, uno, dos, tres. He'll just sit there and count every single bone to make sure he has them all. So we thought, after El Saban has gone through this village and killed like everybody in sight, his sack has got to be pretty big by this point. In fact, it's got to be enormous. And wouldn't it be cool if you had to go in to that sack of bones. And what would you find there? You're just gonna have to wait and see. All right, let's do some more Horror Nights appreciation. Patrick McGee, McGee Effects. Patrick is our makeup artist, our creature creator. You know, he goes all the way back, if you remember the Queen Alien from AVP, all of those amazing things, American World from London, that's all Patrick. Um, Patrick has created some amazing stuff for us over the years. I'll share a little bit about what he's creating for this house. Uh, this is the sculpt from Muerte, and again, it has a, a movable jaw so that it can actually lip sync to track. Uh, this is Patrick's sculpt for La Lechuza. And this is his sculpt for El Saban, and he sent me this really cool video, so you can like watch it. And this is the part that trips me out. It's like, I know it has hair, right? You can see it in the rendering. And I'm like, nobody's ever going to see the back of his head. But Patrick still has to put in all the details, because that's the way he is. Um, and then, um, whoa. Okay, I know that's the mask. Hmm. I guess you'll have to wait and see. <laughs> but wait, there's more! Uh, how about another announcement? Let's do it! Alright, we're gonna mix it up into a scare zone announcement. Because when you come out of this house, we're gonna keep everything going with this theme and take you to a brand new scare zone called El Terror de las Momias. And this is all about inspiration. And the person who supplied the inspiration is Mr. Patrick Quinn. Pat, um, Pat is one of the few people, might be one of the only people that I know and work with at Universe Studios Hollywood who's actually worked there longer than me. 
I think Pat started in the park as Woody Woodpecker, I think, as a character back in the day, but he's worked with Horror Nights with Chris and I since the very, very beginning. And um, the way Chris and I always talk about Pat when we try to explain, like, how we work with Pat is we just go, Pat just thinks different. And it's true, like he comes up with stuff that Chris and I would never come up with. All of the scare zones in the, in the park, that's not my creative, that's not Chris's creative, that's Pat's creative. So give it up for Pat for all the amazing scare zones he's created over the years. And this is what I mean about Pat's creativity. This is what Pat came to us with. He's like, hey, you know, there, in the 1950s in Mexico, there was these really specific horror movies they made um, about Aztec mummies. And, you know, there's like mummies fighting wrestlers and mummies fighting evil robots. Um, but he, he wanted to do something with that idea but do our, our Horror Nights original version. So that meant that Pat had to create a, like a multiverse of movies that don't actually exist. And he did. And that brings up another person on our team that needs a lot of uh, love and respect and, and kudos, and that is Lucas Kolshaw. <laughs> Lucas Kolshaw. Um, is our lead designer illustrator. Every single one of those character drawings I show you, that's all Lucas's work. He draws all of that. If you guys remember Bride of Frankenstein Lives and all the beautiful book artwork, if you remember Holidays in Hell and all of those amazing postcards, that's all Lucas. He created all of that. So you put Pat together with Lucas and they created a multiverse of movies that don't really exist. And it starts with The Mummy That Couldn't Die. And I love that they did, not only did they do the movie poster, they did the lobby card <laughs> for the movie. And these are gonna be used in the scenic, but they're also gonna be used in the video that's part of the scare zone as well. So the idea is here that they made this movie, The Mummy That Couldn't Die, and it was a huge hit. And they were really excited to make a sequel. So they made The Mummy versus The Undead Skeletons in classic horror movie tradition. If it succeeds once, make 20 of them. <laughs> and then they got around to make the third film, you, you get the joke? <laughs> so, this was not me, this was Pat. <laughs> Pat's like, I want to call one of them Revenge of the Mummy, which is funny because I created a Revenge of the Mummy, you know, the ride in my previous life years and years ago. So they made Revenge of the Mummy, but by now, you know, the box office is, is it's not doing quite as well as the first movie in the series, but they gave it another go and they did Escape from the Mummy script. But then, by this point, they've kind of run the, you know, they played out the thread for these mummy movies, and so they decided to go in a different direction, and they did Blood of the Skeleton Queen. <laughs> and they introduced a brand new character, the Skeleton Queen, but the box office wasn't quite there, so they went, you know, that didn't do so well, let's just bring back the mummy and mash it together and do the mummy versus the Skeleton Queen. <laughs> but that didn't do that well at the box office either. <laughs> So by the end, they just said, oh, whatever, just a village of the dead, you know, village of the undead. Um, so all of these pieces were created by, you know, Pat's creativity, Lucas's art, um, and there's a concept. Yes, scare zones actually do have a plot, but it's really simple. You gotta keep it like really, really simple, like a couple of sentences. So I'll give you my best shot at the plot of this scare zone. So somebody, not naming names, possibly the man with no name, dug up an ancient Aztec burial site or tomb in a village and unwittingly or wittingly released a bunch of us undead Aztec warriors upon the village. And they killed everybody in sight and turned all the villagers into the undead. And all of this is being preceded over by who other than the skeleton queen, who's a stilt walker, and uh, that brings up another person on our team, and that is Christina Wright. <laughs> Christina Wright is our costume designer, so she works hand in hand with me and Chris and Pat and Lucas, coming up with how we're going to bring all these costumes to light. So here's like the full cast, except Morte. Morte wasn't invited, apparently. He's not in there. Um, but this is all the work that Christina and her team does to produce these hundreds and hundreds of costumes for our nights. What's next? Crabs and monsters. What the heck is that? Project Eggplant. 
Note to self, announcement delay, delete from deck prior to, oh! Sorry, time for another history lesson. 100 years ago, a legacy of horror began. This is 1923. This is a photograph taken on the Universal lot in 1923. The studio, in the silent film era, undertook possibly the biggest production of its history up until that point. A production that required the construction of massive sets unlike anything they've ever seen built on the lot before, or frankly since, um, including a full-scale replica of a large section of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris and an entire French village. When the cameras started rolling, the cast was so big that they had to invent the first PA system. That's what you see the director wearing the black hat standing next to so that they could communicate with all of the crew members and all of the actors working on the production. The film starred Lon Chaney Sr., the man of a thousand faces, as Quasimodo and literally a cast of thousands. In this picture alone, there's 2,500 extras in this film. This is 1923. The film, of course, is The Hunchback of Notre Dame from 1923. And the reason why I'm talking about this and showing you all this is last year, around this time, I started thinking about, wow, next year's gonna be the 100th anniversary of Hunchback. And it actually came out in the movie theaters September 6th. So like, right when it's 100 years old, Ornix is gonna open, right? So it felt like we needed to pay tribute and homage to the films that started a franchise that we know today as the Universal Classic Monsters, right? Because without Hunchback, none of this would have ever happened. So, once upon a time in Paris. Paris, the city of light. But underneath her bustling boulevards, her noisy cafes, silence is king, and darkness reigns. Sixty feet beneath the city streets of Paris, there is an empire of the dead. The bones of six million Parisianers are buried there in an underground catacomb. But something else is down there, too. The Phantom of the Opera. Far beneath the Palace Garnier, better known as the Paris Opera House. In his underground lair, the Phantom is still down there. And he's not alone. There's someone else down there, too. Quasimodo, the hunchback of Notre Dame, has literally gone underground. Meanwhile, in London, the local authorities are searching for two doctors who are involved with unethical, illegal experiments. The first doctor is Dr. Jack Griffin, better known as the Invisible Man. The second doctor is Dr. Henry Jekyll, whose experiments have led him to embrace the darker side of his nature, known as Mr. Edward Hyde. We dead welcome you to our world of shadow, knowing soon you will be one of us. <laughs> The Universal Monsters Legacy at Halloween Horror Nights continues with a house we just announced on Friday, I believe. Universal Monsters Unmasked. Uh, this is the fifth, the fifth Universal Monster House that we've done at Horror Nights in Hollywood. Um, and again, it takes uh, appreciation not specifically like a team member of Horror Nights, but somebody I really wanted to recognize today, Crash McCreary. Do you guys, do you guys know who Crash McCreary is? Okay. Crash did the key art that I just showed you, all of those illustrations, right? Crash is a legend in the film industry. He started with Stan Winston years and years ago. He helped design the Terminator 
Um, he helped design with Tim Burton, Edward Scissorhands. He helped design movies like Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, Jurassic Park films, etc., etc., etc. So Crash works with us to bring the Universal monsters to life, and so he designed one particular, actually two particular monsters um, that he um, really helped us out with, and that is, I'll show you Crash's illustrations here. Um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now I know what you're thinking. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde isn't a universal monster movie. Au contraire. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, we made a silent version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, like before the studio even came west and became Universal Studios Hollywood. It was what was called a two-reeler in those days. Two reels of film, 26 minutes long, silent film. So we thought we should bring Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and fold him into the Universal Monster family because he was literally the first monster we ever did at Universal. So again, this is an opportunity to do history as horror, which I personally love. Um, and it's all based on real things that happened. Um, this is an old um, 18th century illustration of a cemetery called the Cemetery of the Innocents in Paris. So back in those days, within the city confines of Paris, they were burying people in cemeteries, and then more people would die when you'd have things like the plagues, like the Black Death, the bubonic plague. A whole lot of people died. They just bury them and bury them and bury them and bury them, and they overburied people in the cemeteries inside Paris to the point that some really awful things happened. And these are true. You can actually look it up. I came across it in my research. Literally, imagine you're in a French cafe. I'll sit down for this. Imagine you're having dinner with your wife or your husband or your significant other and you're in a lovely French cafe and you're drinking your wine and you're eating your cheese and all of a sudden the wall cracks open and hundreds of rotting corpses spill into the restaurant. That happened, okay? Sinkholes developed out of the ground and suddenly there were bodies. So bodies were literally coming out of the ground. They buried so many bodies, retaining walls were breaking, bodies were pouring onto the street, and the king at the time, which was King Louis, you know King Louis, right? He was the one who, in the French Revolution, who got guillotined. Um, king Louis uh, did a declaration, and he said, from now on, we are to bury no people within the city limits of Paris. That's not really practical, you know? <laughs> people are gonna continue to die. So they had to figure out what to do with all these bodies. Now Paris is built over a series of um, limestone mines. It's all the materials that were used to build the beautiful architecture in Paris. That's where it came from. And then once they you know, mined all these things out, they just left them. And underneath the city streets, there are endless, endless miles and miles of these tunnels, of these old mines. Um, to this day, they're not all explored. They don't really know where they all lead. But what they eventually did is they went to the cemeteries late at night, under the cover of darkness, they exhumed the bones, they put them on carts, they covered them with black cloth, they took them to like a, a place where there was an opening that led down to the mine, and they just dumped them. They dumped all those bones down there, six million people. And then later, some people uh, that were a little more artfully minded came down there and arranged the bones into an ossuary. And then in 1870, they opened it to the public for the first time, and that's when our house takes place. So, also under the ground, if you've ever seen the Phantom of the Opera, you know he's on that underground lake, and he's rowing his boat, and he's singing away. Um, that does exist. This is a picture of it. This is what it actually looks like. There is a subterranean underground lake underneath the Paris Opera House. They still use it today for, like, fire training, for, like, search and rescue. Um, and the other thing we found when we were doing Hunchback of Notre Dame and going through all the research, we came across this scene from our silent film where uh, Esmeralda, the gypsy, um, she's taken there for questioning when she's wrongfully accused of a crime she doesn't commit. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Victor Hugo novel, Hunchback of Notre Dame, but I can tell you it's very, very different than the, you know, She Lives Happily Ever After novel, or movie. Um, Esmeralda in the book uh, doesn't live. She gets hung. You know, for the crime, she was confused. And, um, yeah. Seems like we should do that. <laughs> There's two other pieces of inspiration for this house. Uh, the black and white image you see, that is the Cafe de la Enfer. 
Um, what this was, was essentially the first themed restaurant, believe it or not. It used to exist in Paris. It was a cabaret or a cafe themed to hell, right? And all the waiters dressed up like devils, and it was all themed on the inside. Uh, this existed in Paris up until about the 1950s, and then they demolished it and turned it into a supermarket. I know. And then another thing we pulled together was the Grand Guignol. Do you guys know what the Grand Guignol Theater was in Paris? It was like an underground theater for the rich and famous who loved to come watch shows where they thought people were really being killed on stage, but it was all an act. So we thought, well, if all these monsters are underground, if the Phantom of the Opera is down there and the Hunchback's down there and Jekyll and Hyde have fled from, or Jekyll and Hyde and, um, Dr. Jack Griffin had fled from London so that they can continue their experiments underground where the authorities can't bother them. They ought to have some entertainment. So we thought, well, there should be like a club, like an exclusive club that you can go to down here. Now the setting. Now I've seen a lot of speculation on this on the internet as well. You're looking at this facade and you're like, what is that? <laughs> there's a little booth and then there's this big, huge blank thing. Um, what that is, is a giant sized reproduction of an English language French newspaper. And where you see the blank spots, both on the facade where it's a different color, and also on that graphic, that's where the illustrations that I just showed you go. It's a whole pre-show we're creating to help tell the story before you go inside. And again, people on the internet, this is a ticket booth, it's a ticket booth, it's not a ticket booth. <laughs> it's a French newspaper stand. And sitting behind that, is an animated skeleton figure that we call Madame Squelette. Squelette is French for skeleton. So we thought, oh, it'd be cool if one of the dead, one of the six million dead that are in these catacombs is actually telling you this story. So that's the voice you heard that I was playing earlier. She's narrating the story, setting it up for you. Lucas's artwork is changing on the newspaper, so we get to do a little bit of a pre-show before you go inside. Now, Madame Squillette also exists as a physical character, but when you're inside the catacombs, she's like back to her mortal state, a character we call the Rat Lady. And the idea is that this is a woman that's down in the catacombs, you know, scouring for any food she can find, so she's literally eating rats. And she has a very advanced case of, um, God, it just left my brain. Rabies. Smallpox. Thank you. Well, smallpox. Fans case of smallpox. So, and we just uh, recently filmed her because she also appears on video. And this is from that. This is like an hour and a half long makeup. It's all prosthetic makeup. And what this speaks to is our show quality and events team. So another recognition we want to give Missy Delgado, who heads up this team. We write all this stuff, then they have to cast it. They have to find the people that are gonna be in our videos, the people that are gonna do our voiceover work. We try as much as possible to pull that right from the people that already work at Universal Studios so we can give them an opportunity to do something different. Um, and then Scott Kleckner. Scott has been with us since the beginning as well. Um, Scott has been in charge of our character program since the very earliest day of Horror Nights. Um, two other individuals I want to shout out to, Zach Gelwicks. It's, you know, been doing this a long time. <laughs> um, I met Zach, I think, when he was 10. I literally met him in the park at Horror Nights as a fan. And now he's a big part of working with our team and training our actors. And then Brian Asrick, who is our casting director, casting all of our talent now. And here's a sneak peek of what's inside. So this is in the catacombs, and we're in the middle of scenic, props and dressing, um, but Chris really went for it to recreate that ossuary look. Let's talk about the music. Flash. 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 <laughs> so, God, 10 years ago, yeah. 10 years ago, 2013, I met Slash at Halloween Horror Nights when he came to see our Black Sabbath house. And um, as soon as we came out of the house, he just turned to me and he was like, I want to do this. Like, how can we work together? And so he started doing music for our houses years and years ago. It started with a house called Clowns 3D. And then, as I mentioned, I'm 
we started getting into Universal Monsters. Slash has done every single score, so that's now five full scores that he's done. Um, but he works with an individual on our team I want to recognize, and that is Stacy Quinolte. Stacy uh, co-writes everything with Slash, co-writes all the music, arranges it, produces it. So Stacy and Slash, before I was heading out for this, I was like, hey, is, do you got a track? You got a track we could share with these people at Midsummer Scream? So we're gonna play you one track from the new score for Universal Monsters Unmasked. It's a track called Silent Screams that features the work of Slash and Stacy Quinolte. Have a listen. You know, um, back in 2021, and we're almost to the end here, uh, remember we did The Bride of Frankenstein Lives? People have been asking me, remember back in 2021, ever, we had to all wear masks, we're still on that point, so like nobody ever got to see what The Bride of Frankenstein looked like. And people have been asking me, like asking me on Twitter, and you know, hey, can we see what The Bride of Frankenstein looked like? So I brought this with me. I just thought you might like enjoy this. Um, this is a time lapse that Pat McGee shot of the Bride of Frankenstein's makeup. So it was full prosthetic makeup to get that burned look. It's probably an hour in the chair, a little bit longer. Um, and I was thinking, it's such a shame 
that nobody got to see that, right? Uh -huh. Seems like you should get an opportunity to see that, doesn't it? <laughs> We're gonna do a little something. Uh, we do, we've been doing more and more of what we call these character interactions, just like places where you can discover a character where you, you know, normally wouldn't find one. So keep your eyes peeled this year at Horror Nights, you might just run into the bride. Fan appreciation time, all right. Here's what we're giving away today. Two express tickets to Halloween Horror Nights and a behind the scenes tour of one of the houses with yours truly. Um, we're gonna do it like we always do it. We're gonna ask a trivia question and um, I'm just gonna pick a random person from the audience and if you get the question,